In modern times, one of the most difficult issues leaders are faced with is helping those who struggle with mental health. No longer can we simply encourage a good measure of scripture study and prayer and expect everyone's life to stabilize. This is why Leading Saints felt it was so important to organize the Mentally Healthy Saints Library. There, one can find 25 plus presentations all about ministering to those who struggle with mental health. We cover topics like depression, anxiety, scrupulosity, or OCD. We even cover how to effectively refer individuals to professional therapists and make sure they are getting the help they need. This and so much more. If you'd like to review all of these sessions, we would love to have you do so at no cost. You can visit leadingsaints.org 14 and get access to the full library for 14 days. You'll also receive access to all our virtual libraries where we cover additional leadership related topics. So click the link in the show notes or simply visit leadingsaints.org 14. Hey everyone, Kurt Frankham here, the host of this podcast, obviously. Before we jump into this episode, uh, it's a little atypical because I recorded this interview on Friday, August 5th, and I intend to publish it Saturday, August 6th. So we'll see how quickly my team can uh, get the turnaround on on editing this and whatnot. But I interview Jennifer Roach, who is a uh, therapist from Seattle, Washington, such a remarkable resource and has a deep experience. personal experience and just expertise in all things abuse, especially in the context of uh, church and when abuse happens at church and through church leaders and whatnot. And recently there was an article published by the AP called Seven Years of Sex Abuse, How Mormon Officials Let It Happen, and it's by Michael Resendez. And this brings up a lot of questions. It it references just a horrible uh, abuse situation that involved the church and the helpline and i think it's really pertinent to to come together as a resource for latter-day saint leaders and talk about this and see what we can learn to hopefully help prevent abuse in the future and really maybe what's being misunderstood about the church's systems and resources that are in place to help prevent abuse again this is a listener discretion advisement here because we do talk about uh, sexual abuse and items related to that so let's jump in with my interview with jen roach so uh, we are in the, uh, the a random lobby of a conference center. I'm here with uh, Jen Roach. Welcome Hi. to the podcast, Jen. Thank, thanks for having me. Yeah, this is the second time you've been on. Right? It is. It's super fun. Yeah, I'm glad to have you back. And usually you're in uh, Washington. Seattle. Yep. Seattle. And uh, came down for fair. Here for fair. Going to do education week. Good. I got a kid who lives down here too. <laughs> yeah. So you just moved to Utah for a few weeks. And <laughs> right. Here you are. Nice. And it was sort of uh, serendipitous that we're here together. And uh, I've you're you're those that, you're one of those that I'm always just want to have at least once a year on the podcast. So please know that you can always ask and come back. But, thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And last time we talked about the concept of the importance of youth uh, bishop interviews with youth yes and you referenced some great research that i always come back to as as people are maybe sometimes hesitant with Mm -hmm. youth interviews in general not just with bishops yep and uh, so we'll link to that and um reference people to uh, check that out for sure it's a a must listen um but recently there's been and and this seems to come up in various contexts not just in our faith and whatnot and you have personal experiences with abuse and clergy and whatnot so i mean where where do you want to start (laughs) with all of this so today is august 5 yesterday august 4 an article came out in the associated press um a very well respected reporter he is previously from the Boston Globe. He, um, he's portrayed in the movie Spotlight about the Catholic Church scandal. He broke that story. Mm-hmm. So the guy's got credibility. So he writes a story about a case that's kind of old. The details on this case have actually been public for quite some time. Um, so his reporting on the case itself isn't new. But what happened was... Someone leaked to him 12,000 sealed documents in an unrelated case in West Virginia, right? And these are documents from the from our church? Or? These are court documents okay. from that case. They oh, were gotcha. sealed. Someone leaked them to him. I, lo- I, love a, I love a document leak as much as the next girl. <laughs> However, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> those documents are known only to him and to the court, so none right. of his work can be checked. So that's probably the first yeah. red flag. Um, 
but what but what he learns in those twelve thousand pages is about the church's helpline and the role that it played in this West Virginia case. This reporter had known about this case in Arizona that the, the story is about yesterday. He had known that. And so he used the knowledge he read in these unrelated documents to piece together some more of what had happened in this Arizona case. Um, the biggest piece of his article is, um, so two girls in this family were being abused by their biological dad. And through the course of time, two of the bishops of the local ward knew about this, had called the church's helpline, and for some understandable reasons, even though not immediately understandable, they were told not to report to the authorities. So why don't we stop, just pause there, and what what is this helpline? I, as a former Thank bishop, I know this helpline sure. and, and used it. Uh, I wore it out on my phone, just like yeah. every little thing. So, so what, what do, how would you explain here's, it? Here's my understanding. I'm not a bishop, so bishop listening can correct me <laughs> yeah. if they would like to. I'll try and fill in, yeah. Right? Um, so my understanding is that when a case, when a bishop learns about something that might be potentially needing to evolve outside authorities, they can call this line, they're instructed to call this line to get some help to understand what are your reporting responsibilities, what's the law in your state or in your county that you need to abide by, um, helping them understand what's their application to the victim, keeping victims safe, preventing future abuse, all these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So bishop number one calls the helpline and is told that he doesn't have to report to the authorities what happened. And this is where I think it gets really messy for people. Yeah, because why would, I mean, it's abuse. <laughs> why, why would anybody say that, right? Right. So you have to understand what mandated reporting is. There's three versions of it. One is you must report no exceptions, right? And that's I, for I'm, a clergy, therapist, Yeah, I'm a mental health yeah. counselor. I live with that rule. All the time I have to tell clients, if you're about to tell me what I think you're about to tell me, you need to know I'm our next call is to CPS, right? Mm -hmm. So I have no option but to not make that call. The second version of mandatory reporting is you, you must report, but there are some exceptions. Um, clergy have exceptions. Certain medical situations have exceptions. And it's state by state. None of the laws are the same. What, what the actual exceptions are in each state is, is slightly different. And then in the third version of mandated reporting, you may not report. The church just last year got dragged into court in Oregon because a woman is suing the church. Her husband confessed to abuse to the bishop. The bishop reported to the police, which at that time was against the law in his state. So the church is being dragged into court in Oregon for reporting, mm -hmm. right? So the helpline is there because these three different versions of mandated reporting exist in all the different states and some counties even have rules on top of them. So there is no one possible piece of advice to say, Here, here's what you do, bishops, mm -hmm. because one and three are mutually exclusive. You must report and you must not report. If you give if you give the advice you must report, you get an Oregon situation, right? So that's what the helpline is trying to do, trying to help these bishops who are probably what a general contractor or an insurance yeah. salesman yeah. or something. Yeah, right? I was a marketing major. Yeah, Thank you. Doing that right, um, and, and this I just want to really nail this is that this is why I appreciate it from the bishop standpoint. I appreciated that helpline so much. And I remember some instances I called and I'm just like, this is kind of silly. I know this isn't a big deal, but I want the record to show that yeah. I called the helpline and, and got some advice. And sometimes it was like, Oh, I wouldn't. Yeah. I, this is completely out of my league. Mm -hmm. And this direction I'm getting is very helpful for, to protect me as an individual, protect those, the, the victim and, and all involved. Right? Yep. When, you know, when I was a very young therapist and had to make my very first CPS call in my state at the time, you got 48 hours to report. It took me every single one of those 48 hours to get myself together enough to understand how to report. I talked to a supervisor and I talked to a peer consult group and I talked to all kinds of people. What do I need to know? What are they gonna ask me? How do I how do I even say all of these things, right? Mm -hmm. And I've probably made a hundred reports since then. I used to work in chemical dependency, so there's lots of reports in that population. So I got really, really comfortable with 
making a CPS phone call. However, most insurance salesmen or marketing majors have never made a CPS call. Mm. I was a trained therapist and it took me every bit of 48 hours to wrap my mind around what I needed to do. Yeah. I cannot imagine some poor bishop sitting somewhere being left on his own. Just, All right, buddy, give him a call without any prep for here. Here's, here's what you can expect when you talk to CPS. Yeah, yeah. Um, so going back, you, you mentioned those three cases. So this is in, in a very simplified method is in, in a perfect world we think we found out of abuse i'm going to call the police the police are going to drive to the home arrest the man and you know and yeah. roll the credits everybody's safe and, and wonderful but it's much more complicated than that and even in some states uh, like oregon mm-hmm. if if a bishop was just to do that he would be in trouble and then it's a whole nother mess right? there's actually some interesting research too that says mandated reporting laws make less reporting mm-hmm. right yeah um because you're only going to report and they back up certain people are only going to report that if they know it's not a mandated reporting situation right so yeah and it's that, complicated there's a lot right. of tensions there because then some people might think well why would a state even have that law right yeah. and the reality is is that if we can foster a situation it's it's never perfect mm-hmm. where at least uh, we would much rather have in a state where it's illegal to report at least somebody's coming to a bishop and saying i'm out of control or this yeah. happened or i need help you can't report it but and now we have something to work with and that's actually what the guy in this case does it's the only moral thing that i can find any evidence that he ever did is he told his bishop I'm abusing my daughters. Yeah. Actually, it was just one daughter at the time when he confesses it. And this is this is in Arizona. It's in Arizona. Okay. The the date of the start of the abuse is a little... At, at one point, they say t- um, 2010. At one point, they say 2011. 2011 seems more likely to me, but I've read most of the court documents, but not all of them, so... I mean, yeah. that's my guess. Yeah. And so in the, you mentioned these three mm-hmm. uh, types of laws. Yeah. So what was it in for Arizona? So at that time, they were a law too, which said you must report, but there are exceptions. Okay. So the guy reports the abuse to the first bishop. This is the abuser. The abuser. His mm-hmm. name is um, Paul Douglas Adams. Um, he reports to his bishop. I'm molesting my seven-year-old daughter, Mm -hmm. right? So the bishop, as far as I can understand, believed that the abuse had ended. Mm -hmm. He has a meeting. He's got the man in his office. They immediately call the wife in, and the wife admits that she knows this is going on. She does her best to protect the children from him. They have lots of very specific rules in their house around how the kids are allowed to interact with dad but clearly dad breaks all the rules and they from what i can tell the couple presents to bishop number one it's just, it's not happening anymore mm-hmm. yeah. and and here's i just want yeah. to highlight this is that in all of these situations and you know some writes an article they have leaked uh documents and whatnot mm-hmm. but there is so much information we don't know unfortunately yeah. and it's not that we're trying to protect anybody or make the church look good or yeah. whatever because in this instance the church maybe isn't looking awesome but it is it is what it is you, there's a lot of information you know and to be fair this reporter did a solid job mm-hmm. he did he did his job yeah. there's a there's a saying that says newspapers write the first draft of history mm-hmm. and that's what this guy did is it the final draft absolutely not he, he, but he did his job our job add some context add some understanding add like what's the church issues around all of this he doesn't understand yeah. all of that yeah. right so that's kind of i hope what this conversation does is so that it a sounds little. like and again we have all the information mm-hmm. this was reported by the abuser and his wife mm-hmm. the bishop was in the impression that the um abuse had stopped Correct. and so he's in this mode of like great well let's get this figured out spiritually and yeah. get, and, and work through this mom and the yeah. kids seem to attend the church pretty regularly mm-hmm. dad does not um so he bishop is kind of just doing what he does he's trying to take care of the people that he has ability to take care of and obviously went to the helpline went to the helpline to, to get advice got yeah. his advice they they gave him technically legally correct advice as far as i can tell i'm not an attorney um but it seems like they told him something that's true for the laws in arizona at that time 
bishops change over at some point. Bishop number one gives the information to bishop number two of, hey, this is this is what's going on. Um, bishop number two calls the mom in and just like, hey, I have heard about this. Just want to check in. Like, how are you guys doing? How can I serve you? Blah, blah, blah. And mom reveals things have happened since we told the last mm-hmm. bishop. And so this is new information. So a second call to the helpline is made. But that second bishop also understands the, the abuse to have ended. Some of this has to do with the mom. Um, the mom is somewhere on the autism spectrum. Um, this is all in the court documents. She is basically emotionless about most things. Yeah. Isn't really feeling the gravity of it for whatever Correct. reason. Yeah. There's a... There's a there's a scene described in the court paperwork of the first time the Border Patrol agents come. He works for Border Patrol. The father does. So the first time they come to his home to figure out what's what. And all the kids have been sequestered. There's six kids in the family. All the kids have been sequestered in a Border Patrol vehicle. And mom is trying to gather up the children's stuff so they can go to school tomorrow. Their instruments and their school books and a change of clothes and, and all the things. And she's running around the house trying to get all this done. And the Border Patrol agent, who probably... When you think of emotional people, I don't think Border Patrol agents come to the top of your list, (laughs) right? But even the agent is like, this woman is emotionally dead. There's something Mm -hmm. wrong with her. Um, She has her own history of abuse. She's She's dealing with it in a way that made sense to her. But the ways that made sense to her were, I'm going to lay down rules, and that will take care of the issue. Mm-hmm. So one of the rules is, like, children are allow- not allowed to sit on dad's lap. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a solid rule. Dad doesn't ever follow that rule. But in mom's mind, that's taking care of the issue. So it's a very much like, this was an issue. I've taken care of it. It's over. Yeah. So you can kind of see how the bishops got that understanding of, this isn't, this isn't happening more. It's a crisis. It's terrible. Yeah. There, from everything I can tell, there is not evidence that they were trying to cover this up. Um, the man, so there's seven, there's seven years of abuse that goes on before he's arrested. Um, he was a member of the church for three years. Or there's actually a question of like, what kind of member? Was he a member? I don't know. So maybe a convert? Something. Then, okay. Something. Yeah, not hey, a lifelong. Don't okay. hate on converts. Right, right. We love you, you people. <laughs> Keep coming. <laughs> um, he he's only in the church for three years because he's disfellowshipped or whatever they called it back then mm-hmm. um, because the bishops were trying to get him to make some changes and he wouldn't and so they're like you are out there's a tiny bit of a question about how active was this guy actually uh-huh. the article makes it sound like he is a well respected absolutely active member in full good standing. Possibly the next Elder's Quorum president. Just Absolutely. Right, yeah. He could be bishop next. We better uh-huh. watch out. Two pieces of evidence that that's probably not true. One is the Border Patrol agent interviews a number of families in the ward. They don't know what is going on. They're just being interviewed about this family. And all of them say they're weird. There's, some, there's something odd there. We don't see the dad mm-hmm. a lot. But everybody knows there's something weird in that family. And again, I think that's important to mention because I think some... Um, individuals may say, "Well, yeah, the church was trying to protect this. You know, he was our the the best of our best, and we want we don't want and him to look bad." That's not true. It's and just then not the they, case. he he rarely attended, and then they kicked him out. Yeah. The other the other piece of evidence that shows he's not he's probably not even an endowed or ordained member is that his disciplinary council is conducted by his bishop. Hmm. Right, not the stake president, which I, I floated that theory out to a few friends and kind of got some pushback of like, well, a bishop technically could maybe do it if it wasn't that big of a deal, but this yeah. was a big deal. Yeah, so, from my experience, incredibly rare, especially if he was a Melchizedek priesthood holder, which it maybe sounds like he wasn't. It sounds like he was not. Yeah. Do I know that for sure? No. Yeah, again, this goes, but there's so much information we don't know, right? Yeah. 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 So let me, let's go back to. I think one big question that people mm-hmm. have is that, okay, the bishop called the helpline. Why on earth would that attorney on the other end of mm-hmm. the, the line not say, just go report it? Because even maybe, maybe did he have the impression that the bishop said, this is, this is done, it's mm-hmm. not happening anymore, maybe that influence? But what do you think there? Absolute guess. I 
I don't speak yeah. for the church. I don't right, speak right. for these things. <laughs> I don't speak for Kurt. <laughs> um, that's my understanding of why they would have said that to him. Mm-hmm. Um, mandated reporting does come at a cost to the victim. And these were very young victims. So you've got to weigh out a lot of competing is- interests here mm-hmm. and to make the call to say the abuse is over, we're getting them therapy, dad's trying maybe at some point to cooperate. That's what the attorney ends up telling them. Um, from a, I'm not a lawyer, but from a legal standpoint, you can understand like letter of the law that's the correct letter of the law advice to give. Is it the correct moral advice to give is a different question. Yeah. I have my opinions on that. I think most people feel like, yeah, you should have, you should help these kids out. Yeah. And with hindsight now, I, I would imagine that attorney, that bishop, everybody involved is just like, oh, man, we should have done yeah. maybe something more in this anecdotal experience. This yeah. is, um, I mean, I think it's fair to say as a church we failed these two girls. They suffered longer and for more. It is one of the most horrific descriptions of abuse that I have ever heard. Mm. I won't even tell you, but it's it's way worse. The article tames it down. The court documents are horrific. Um, they tell them what they tell them. We sh- we should have done better by those girls. There's a quote in the AP article from M1. Um, what, I can't remember what they call it in the article. In the court papers, they call the, child, the girls M1 and M2, older and younger. Uh-huh. Uh, there's a quote from M1 in the AP article where she says, like, Mormons are the worst kinds of people. They are terrible. And, and she has every right to say that. Those girls deserve the biggest settlement allowable. And they, they deserve every single penny we failed them. However, I also can see the helpline point of view that they gave the technically correct legal advice, as far as I can tell. Yeah, yeah. So, um, where do we go from here? As far like maybe the what like what do we learn from this or takeaways? Like, because here we are. I, I don't necessarily want to come across like, oh, there's this church. That, there, there's this article that makes the church look bad. Mm-hmm. So we're going to refute it and be, it's no, not no, a big no, deal. No, no, right. no. The article should be listened right. to. Yeah. And, Every my my opinion is every leader in our church should read that article. That guy has earned the credibility to be listened to. People should understand what's at stake here. However, the average person sitting in the pew is probably going to go to their bishop, be like, "Oh my gosh, did you hear of this terrible abuse story in our church? Covered it up, and oh my gosh, is it our church's practice to regularly cover up abuse? And do we protect abusers?" The answer to that is a hard no. Right. That is not church policy. You can go read it for yourself in the handbook. Anybody can. That is not what the helpline is doing. It is what the AP article accuses the helpline of doing. It is what all of Twitter (laughs) apparently is accusing the church of doing. That is not the purpose of the helpline. Yeah. So let's talk about the helpline. Just in theory, and obviously you Mm -hmm. have experience uh, in other uh, faith experiences Mm -hmm. and whatnot. Is this helpline idea a good idea to have? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. In... From the legal point of view, absolutely. We're talking 50 different states, multiple counties who put ordinances on top of their state regulations, plus how many countries around the world? There's no way to put out one single piece of advice. Here, bishops, do this. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. Also, so comparing it to a totally different kind of faith experience. Our church is very... um, hierarchical, right? We have a structure. There's people. There's all, everybody's got somebody over them, except for the prophet. He's got God over him, and, and, and that's about it. But yeah. everybody else has got somebody over them. Right. There's a lot of, like, your non-denominational church founded by some guy and his wife. They don't have anybody over, over them. Mm-hmm. And so that guy alone makes the choice of what should I do here. Yeah. He's probably trained as a pastor. Pastors do get a little bit on the ethics of this, but not tons. He's not super much better trained. I, 
I was trained as a pastor. I have a Master of Divinity degree. I know exactly what that training is. It's not that much more than your friendly mm -hmm. general contractor who happens to be bishop. So he doesn't know what to do either, and he's doing it in complete isolation, where the temptation to say, oh, so-and-so is a great member of the church, he would never do that to his kids. That's how the non-denominational whatever churches get themselves in trouble because there's it just turns into an insular we are going to protect abusers essentially so the the helpline i think legally and philosophically is good because it prevents that it prevents mm -hmm. the bishop from saying but i really like that guy who's an abuser right and abusers are charismatic nah, this guy doesn't actually sound like he fits that but in general they are and so Abusers not only groom victims, they groom families, they groom congregations, they groom bishops yeah. to convince them that they're great. And if it was just left to the bishop, the temptation to be like, no, 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 he's a good guy, it's just, yeah. too, it's just too big. And a bishop could still say that, right? Well, I really like that guy. Maybe mm -hmm. I can work through this with him personally. I, I'm not going to call the legal line. But from my experience, there's just this overwhelming encouragement. No, call the legal call line. Call the legal, the legal line. Legal line. I, I mean, I probably still have this saved in my phone. I, I, it was so rarely available. And again, it's because uh, I, I think the other argument is like, oh, it's our lay ministry that we have these mm -hmm. untrained um, uh, you know, bishops yeah. in these roles. But like you said, you don't get a lot more training. Yeah. Plus, and so, but the fact that we have this legal line to call where we we have that resource yep. and we can make a better decision yeah. um, going forward. Right? I, I, I understand the broken heart of a lot of members right now who are saying, oh no, my church runs this hotline to help hide abuse. Mm -hmm. Not what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's this feeling that like the, this helpline is structured primarily to protect the church from any legal mm -hmm. issues and whatnot. And um, and like you said, these 12,000 pages that were released had nothing to do with this case in Arizona. Correct. Correct. That, was, that was a West Virginia case. Okay. And, and remind me how they connect. Or what, uh, um, the West Virginia documents detail what the helpline is okay. in a way that that's the right. Arizona documents that are publicly available don't. That's how the reporter started to understand the role of the helpline in this Arizona case. Okay. So why do you think the helpline doesn't go to a a social worker rather than an attorney? Uh, or, or maybe should it? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, you know, I also... Uh, so there are questions there. Who actually is the entirety of the staff of this helpline? My understanding is the first person answering the phone is an attorney. Yep and should be an attorney, right? Because they need practical advice, right? Mm -hmm. Do I make the phone call or don't I, right? In some states, the clock is ticking. As soon as you find out abuse, you've got what, 24, 48, sometimes 72 hours, yep. right? So that that's appropriate. I have heard from someone who has reason to know, they also have social workers who could become a resource to the bishop of like, <laughs> this is this. Does that always happen? I have no idea. I have no access to any of that information. Mm -hmm. um, should social workers be the first one to answer the phone? No, they should not. And and part of that has to do with social workers and therapists are generally not trained in how to collect evidence that is the truest version of evidence. Mm -hmm. Social workers and therapists don't care about that, yeah. right? So uh, a forensically trained social worker does, but that's a very, very specialized training, right? My training as a therapist says, you should not be the first person who talks to a victim. The police should, mm. right? Or the client's attorney or some attorney should because they understand differently how evidence needs to be protected and not manipulated the, I mean you know the, the the preschool case in California right this couple runs a preschool in their home they get all kinds of sexual abuse charges it's like a 20 year old case the people who collected evidence from the children were social workers who led the children's testimony in incredible ways they did not collect testimony in the way an attorney would. Um, so would it be appropriate at some point to refer to a social worker? Sure, but they should not be first line. And, and 
even in my profession, that's our ethic. Yeah. And I remember several times uh, as a bishop calling that helpline, it would be, okay, give me all the information, maybe be a 20-minute call. And he's like, okay, mm-hmm. I will get back to you. Yeah. Right? It's not like he, in that moment, he would give me direction. A lot of time it would be, be like, oh, you're a cute bishop that right, thinks right. this is an issue. So thanks for calling bishop, but no. <laughs> Good right? job, buddy. <laughs> but there were times where it was a little more complicated that mm-hmm. they, would, they would get back to me. So who knows who they talked to about that. Correct. Plus, the other thing is, if there is an abuser out there, the general recourse is a legal uh, legal action to Absolutely. stop him, right? And so even though it's an abuse case of morality, mm-hmm. d- d- definitely, it, in order to stop it, it immediately com- becomes a legal yeah. uh, process, which in- needs to involve yes. lawyers who know yes. the law. Right? Here, here's the other practical piece of why I think this is interesting. And you and I have talked a little bit about this, which is the issue of background checks. Yes, I wanted to bring this up. Yeah, so... Because this is the general premise. Is we, every once in a while, you hear of a case where a youth leader or mm-hmm. even a bishop mm-hmm. is, you know, you see the mugshot and you're like, oh man, an abuser got into that position. How mm-hmm. did we not stop it? Yes. We need to do background checks. Yes. If everybody got they a get background, on board. yeah. There's then, a current petition going around right now to mm-hmm. get the church to do background checks. So here, and again, here. I, I would, I would say <laughs> we don't really know how much the church does background checks. Sure. And no. just from being in the state presidency and calling different bishops, mm-hmm. just not process it alluded to the, th- it gave me the impression that there's some background checks happening, but Probably. I really don't know that. Right. Anyways, continue. So, so the dad in this case, Adams, Paul Adams, um, we know he abused his two daughters for seven years. We know he had extensive viewing of child pornography for years before that. Mm-hmm. We know not from any court documents, but from likelihood, maybe these weren't his first victims. There's records on him years before viewing, potentially producing child pornography. Let me ask you, Kurt, (laughs) at what point would this guy come back with something on his background report? Um, After... Um, he's, produ- I mean, he's producing child porn uh, yeah, that's th- seen all over the world. I mean, after it, somebody had reported him and it was there's like a legal filing of some type or what? So the answer in this case is never. Really? He never. He so he worked for Border Patrol. Okay. Border Patrol does an extensive federal background check, better than anything the church would do, mm-hmm. and he passes it every single year. Mm-hmm. Right. The reason this would never show up on his background report is you have to be convicted. Oh, he, okay. Yeah, because guilty till or yeah. innocent until proven guilty, right? Yeah. So, so Adams is arrested. He's not in jail very long before he commits suicide. He never, he never stands trial. Yeah. His, his wife does. His wife actually gets two years, serve, serves her two years. She's already out. Which is another reason we don't have a lot of information regarding this case. Correct. Is there's no trial. Right? Correct. Um, so a background check would have come back clean for him every single time. Now imagine this. You're in charge of some youth organization, and, and Brother Adams comes in and says, Hey, I want to volunteer with the kids. Like, I have a lot of energy. Like, this would be so great. And, the, and, and you say to him, like... Well, we take child safety here very seriously. We got to do a background check on you. What does Adam say? Sure. Do it. Yeah. I have a background check from the Border Patrol every single year. They update it every single year. Mm-hmm. Do it. The Whoever's running that organization gets his background check clean, calls him up. Hey, guess what? Clean. We're ready to introduce you to the kids. Mm-hmm. Background checks catch very, 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 very few people, people who are only convicted. Should they be done for those just because of that? Yes. I will say yes, they should. However, the huge danger in background checks is whoever's running that youth organization and just let Paul Douglas Adams in with his clean background check Mm -hmm. has been fooled by the system that they trusted, this background check system, into thinking that Adams is safe when he's a monster, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So organizations let down the walls for people who can jump over the background check hurdle. And then they're given trust and access to children. Yeah. And the background check system is a net with a hole big enough to drive a bus through, yeah. and that bus is full of child predators. Nice. <laughs> so with that in context, like, I mean, what... Is there anything we could do or, I mean, I know the church has its uh, youth protection program, Mm -hmm. which is great. I mean, it's something, right? Yep. Um, But I'm just thinking of those bishoprics sitting in an office Uh, calling a new young women's president, right? right? Like, or a, a... 
what do we call them now? The, the priest quorum advisor or right. something, right? Uh, so, is there anything we could do or so consider? everybody? It, it's a it's a great question, and I feel like I've answered five hundred versions of that question in the last five years. <laughs> uh-huh. Everybody wants to know what's the what is the answer, and it just there just is not one thing. It has to be a whole pie with lots of different tools to use. So a background check can be one. If somebody already has a conviction on their case, please don't put them with children. Like, yeah. like, like we should know about that. And the church has great processes that I remember as a bishop, a record would move in. Mm-hmm. If it had an annotation on there that said, do not, we, that would then be required to call the church, yes. get the information. And a lot of it was usually, they just can't serve with youth. And yeah. And that's actually one of my favorite safety features in our church. Mm-hmm. So, so that's one tool. The 2D pool is a tool. Mm-hmm. Um, the Larry Nasser case, are you familiar with that case? He's mm-hmm. the doctor, he's the physician for the U.S. women's gymnastic team. Oh, yeah, team. yes. And I he saw abused, the documentary. Yes, yes. <laughs> he's awful. He abuses yeah. these girls for years and sometimes does it while their parents are in the room. Because it's just a routine medical checkup, right? Yeah, and, and that is such a... That's a head game to those girls, right? Yeah. Because it's not only... Not only I can abuse you, it's... I can abuse you in broad daylight and no one cares about you, mm-hmm. right? So the two deep work, two deep rule works when it works. Yes. And it's one of those things we might as well do it, right? Absolutely. We got the, the human resources, let's do it. Yeah. When it doesn't work, it's awful. Yeah, and probably very rare. Yeah. I mean, that's it, a, it, it's a tool. Yeah. It's one tool. Mm-hmm. There's no... Researchers for forever have been trying to say, what are the characteristics of someone who commits abuse? Like, could, can we identify those yeah. people? The only thing they can agree on is they're more likely to be male. Mm-hmm. Period. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so. I mean, is there anything to the fact that typically abusers were once abused? Is that uh, fair? Or is that just? <laughs> I mean, there. Okay. So yes, there is some research that suggests that. Okay. And even in this case, we see it. The mom was abused, and the mom is here, kind of justifying the abuse of her children. Mm-hmm. At one point, she says, we got to make a family compromise, and that compromise is going to be that M1 is allowed to have sex with dad, and that's just how it has to be, right? So she's been abused. She's in, She has a victim's mentality, and, and she makes... So you see that in her. Yeah. However, the vast majority of victims do not grow up to abuse. Mm-hmm. So, so our... Are were abusers abused? Yeah, probably, but don't generalize that to everyone. Yeah, because that would be so unfair, <laughs> right? They're like, well, we see that you were abused as a kid, so we so need to be sorry. very skeptical of you. Yes, right? don't and, do that ooh, to people. That's Gross. no good. Yeah, another a, a, another tool, maybe in the big pie, is to listen to the kids, and this gets dicey, and I know that. How? Let me tell you a short story. There's a very expensive private school in Seattle near where I live. They bring in a whole team of people for a week of education for the kids, K-12, to on how do you recognize abuse, and how do you talk about abuse, and how do you stranger danger abuse, and relative abuse, and like all the various versions, and they educate these kids for a week on this. Well, three little seven, seventh grade girls get together, and they say, gosh, teacher so-and-so he really gives me the creeps he's never touched me he's never done anything but every time i'm around him i feel it and all three of these girls are like me 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 too Mm -hmm. so they make a appointment with the school principal to say hey we just got all this education we just want to share with you what we have seen from this male teacher and the principal turns around and tells them you girls need to stop playing little detective you need to not say things like that about people. You're mm-hmm. going to ruin his career. Mm-hmm. Shut it down. And it's such an unfortunate story. Yeah. I have no evidence of, like, is this teacher abusive or isn't he? I literally have no evidence of that. But those girls knew what was up. Three seven-year-old girls, seven, seventh-grade girls coming to you saying, we feel weird around so-and-so. That should be listened to. Um, I get it. I get the principal's concerns. You're going to ruin someone's life on the word of a 13-year-old girl. Yeah. And kids should be listened to more than they have historically been listened to on this topic. Mm-hmm. So that's another piece of the pie. Having and it, and windows- it's usually like just 
nuance like clues like that where it's like he gives me the creeps he didn't oh he you know locked me in a closet right. and he did this and that if it's, it's these nuanced things that we just need to lean into a little bit more yeah. sit with right and 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 the piece related to that you and I talked about this last time we sat down is mm -hmm. when kids reveal abuse the vast majority of the time it's unintentional at least kids who are under age 18 they don't <laughs> Dear Bishop, they do not come into your office and sit down and say, hey, I want to reveal this abuse to you. Yeah. They make a weird comment. And that was your story. I think you told that last time, right? Yeah. It was, you they, were not intending to... Yeah, they make a weird comment that the kid maybe knows what they're doing. Maybe they don't know what they're doing. But they need an adult to pick that comment up and go really how does your dad know so much about what your underwear looks like that's mm -hmm. weird you're 14 mm -hmm. right yeah. can you tell me a little more about that mm -hmm. but often i think it's true of leaders in general and i think my heart goes out to men on this because the criticism is well that's a creepy thing to ask a 14 year old girl mm -hmm. she just said some strange comment let it go in fact it would be abusive of you to ask her about yeah, that she comment. mentioned her underwear why do right? you want to ask follow-up questions yeah back right? off bishop yeah, yeah yeah but the reality is that might be what actually is an abuse disclosure that she needs someone to pick that up and say huh tell me a little bit more about that yeah and a, in general, with teenagers especially, and with children for certain, abuse doesn't come out in one conversation. It comes out in little bits and pieces over time. Leaders, bishops especially, but all church leaders would do well to understand this is how kids disclose. They are not going to make an appointment with you and say, here's my evidence that I was abused. Yeah. And here's how it played out. Kids don't think like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, often, and I would, uh, I, my mind often goes to this uh, idea that, you know, we often hear about, you know, there's got to be more we can do to protect, you know, kids at church or mm -hmm. the leaders yeah. or youth leaders. But I don't know the statistics, but from what I know is the vast majority of abuse comes from a family member like this Arizona case, Yeah, a family right? member, someone who's closely known by the yeah. child. An uncle or mm -hmm. things like that, a right? A school teacher, something. Yeah, so is there anything... Um, like from a, I'm just thinking of a bishop. Like, is there anything a, a church leaders could do to, you know, not just shine light on what's happening in primary during the second mm -hmm. hour, but saying like, how can we be more aware of what's happening in the home to protect on that yeah. level? Yeah. So statistically, most most abuse doesn't happen on a church campus. <coughs> Grooming happens on the campus. An abuser is put in a position of trust. The kids and parents look to that person and say, the church has vetted this guy. Mm -hmm. He's safe. And they put their trust in him. And then when he starts to get close to the family, hey, I'm going to come to the soccer game and watch your kids play. The parents think, oh, what a nice Sunday school teacher he yeah. is. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Which, which, which is he great. Is, I mean, right? <laughs> we're not saying don't go to their school, their <laughs> soccer games, but this is the tactics they use, right? Yeah. So, parents and kids need to be skeptical. I hate that. That's what it is. Yeah. yeah. You, you need to be skeptical, not cold-hearted, not mm -hmm. accusing, but a little bit like, mom and dad, you're still in charge of your kids. Don't hand over trust all that easily even when it's mom and dad maybe it's your own sibling yeah yeah and i'm just thinking you know hypothetical like oh great you know the sunday or the primary teachers come to the soccer games that's yeah. cool and then it's like oh they're doing a activity at his house like yeah. why not at the church i yep. wonder you know what i'm just not gonna let my child go to that yeah. or i'm gonna have a conversation with somebody or or yeah. whatnot right two two other thoughts on that um i know this is controversial <laughs> Parents would do well to not let their children go to sleepovers. Yeah, that, that's actually been, I've had that, I have a 10 year old daughter yeah. and she keeps coming back to me with the sleepover thing. And I'm yeah. just like, we just don't do sleepovers. I'm sorry. Yeah. I cannot tell you the number of therapy stories I have heard of. Yeah. My life was going great. And then yeah. at eight years old, I went to the sleep. So that, so that's and, and another their, tool. Their childhood is not damaged at all by not having the sleepover memory. That's you know, I right. did sleepovers as a kid and they were kind of fun memories, right? Yeah. And nothing uh, traumatic happened, yeah. but. You know, I, I'm just going to say that's one that I'm going to take that away and we'll have other memories that's elsewhere. Right. Right? We'll do many other fun things yeah, with friends and neighborhoods. And yeah. the, the, the final little piece on that is there is some evidence that while you can't identify abusers very accurately, you can identify victims a little more accurately. Mm. So kids who um, 
I hate that this is what it is, but it is. Kids in single mom homes are more vulnerable to abuse. Kids in foster homes are more vulnerable to abuse. Kids who have any kind of little difference in them, if they're on the spectrum, if their sexuality is, is presenting differently, all of those kids are more at risk. And the good adults in a ward can do really well to be a helpful, just watching eye. Who's paying attention to this kid? What's going on? Run some interference if you need to. If When the adults understand sort of who are the kids who aren't getting what they need at home, stuff is really hard for them mental health-wise or emotionally, they need a bigger team of adults that are looking out for them. And, and I'd re reiterate that, that they need to feel like they have that group of adults yeah. looking out for them rather than, you know, we're in these, you know, backroom meetings talking about how to protect the kids. But, yep. to, you know, I, I try and have those conversations with, with my daughter and son of just saying, like, I've got your back. If anybody yes. hurts you and they tell you never to tell me, like... No, yeah. that's not happening, and, right? I mean, the way our wards are set up is so ideal for that. Hmm. So absolutely ideal to make that happen. And I think lots of people just do it naturally yeah. without even understanding, oh, what I'm doing is actually a research-backed behavior. But it is. Yeah, yeah. And with these just tragic cases that, mm -hmm. that's happened in Arizona, like, our heart just bleeds for these, these girls and what happened and the fact that our church leaders were you know in the storyline and the narrative and whatnot mm -hmm. like we're just like oh, i just want to go back in time and fix it all right yeah. and then we get in this mindset of like even one is too many right and yeah. so there's got to be more we can do and that's where we look and then we want to point at the helpline we want to yeah. point like that's the problem this is the problem and and i get that and you hear that sort of things problems in society mm -hmm. frame that way and the reality is is like the mortality we live in i just don't think there's ever a way no matter what we do to to not let even one happen and so the way i yeah. see it is with the current structure we have we could say well i it, one is too many but in my mind a hundred's too many and yeah. i think what if the which we can never measure or know what if the current system that we're using is actually protecting thousands that would yeah. be abused but now only ones are being abused and that one is yep. not a statistic it's a person it's a real life yep. it's years of therapy it's trauma it's so much but generally speaking as an organization moving forward we really don't know how many we are are saving and, and that's when people when people come after bishops or the whole structure or interviews i'm just like listen like that bishop could be the greatest protector mm -hmm. of bringing these things to the surface that we never even know so we can't just cancel them all or say yeah. you know we're not doing this anymore and think they're fixed it right and yep. anyway, there's my soapbox for and, a minute but. and what are you gonna what are you gonna do to fix it like this is one of the things the pandemic revealed was uh, more kids got abused during the pandemic because they were at home. Yeah. And home is where you're likely to be abused. And safety was the number one value and priority in everybody's yeah. mind, right? Yeah. And there are not school teachers or Sunday school teachers or mm -hmm. youth leaders with eyes on these kids to catch the abuse and report it. Yes. So what are you going to do? Not have any church activities and keep all the kids at home where they're more in danger? Mm-hmm. Or are, are you going to have, like, only ward activities and not ever let them go home? Now that's also weird in a different way. There is no you. There is no way yeah. to bubble wrap a kid to 100% be certain that abuse doesn't happen. The only way to do that is if mom or dad dedicate themselves to being by that chi child's side 24-7 with their eyes glued to them, a la the parents of... Yeah. women athletes yeah. who got their girls abused right in front of their eyes and didn't even know what they were looking at. Right, right. And so, like I said, I would make the argument that we are saving and protecting way more potential mm -hmm. victims than that are actually being victimized. Yeah. And I want to be very clear, we're also not saying these things can't be looked at or we figured out the perfect system, right. this is the best we can do. I mean, just the ideas we discuss here, there's, there's a lot to look at and consider and, mm -hmm. you know, and we're willing to have those conversations, but to just say our system's broken and is perpetuating abuse is not fair. One of the, the huge accusations that's being made online and other places about this is that the bishops just stood idly by knowing these girls were being abused at that very moment and just did nothing. And that is not what happened here. If you... If you even read the AP article in detail, you will understand that's not what happened. But a lot of people skimmed it. 
It's a big article. I understand people aren't used to reading 2,000 words, mm -hmm. but that is not what happened here. They, these were not bishops who threw up their hands and said, oh, well, it's just a kid getting abused. Who cares? Yeah. They were working with this family in all of the ways that they could understand to do it and trying to make changes. And when changes weren't made, he got excommunicated. Yeah. Another thing I want to point out is, you know, I, I try and take the sort of the devil advocates approach to sure. be like, okay, let's imagine that the church did was sort of, there's some conspiracy. They wanted, they didn't, what, what do they gain from mm -hmm. protecting abusers? Right. And I, I just don't, can't find it. And mm -hmm. one may say, and, and I think this is the inspired structure of, of our faith tradition of this lay ministry is that as you've, as you've experienced or seen in other faiths, you get the, the 40 year pastor who's just like so <sighs> well respected, like removing him from yeah. office is or from that position is very difficult and has so many cultural dynamics and community That's dynamics. That's Willow Creek Church. Willow Creek was the largest church in America for a long time. And Bill Hybels was their pastor, mm -hmm. sexually abused towards adults in the church, but still, it's an issue. Um, that church is still careening out of control, yeah. and it's been like six years since he got removed, and since all of this came out, they actually mm -hmm. let him retire happily, even though they knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. That church will collapse in the next three years, is my prediction. Mm -hmm. Because he was a 40-year pastor at one point, the pastor of the largest church in America, yeah. right? And made this entire culture where you look the other way. Yeah. Where in our faith tradition, uh, bishops, really society presidents, bless your heart. We are grateful for the work you do. But at the end of the day, you are disposable. Yeah. And you're, you're going to be another two years, another five years. We're just going to get a new guy anyway. So. Yep. We can we can replace the, if if there is conspiracy there it's not there's no problem with getting the new bishop yep. in place and moving forward. It, that um, factor the you're only in your role for a, a little while is actually one of the protective factors for kids in our church. You don't have a guy sitting in some position for forty years to yeah. abuse kids. You also, I mean, maybe you get someone who's like, hey, I really love the youth. I really love a youth calling. But it's different than another church where there's an announcement practically every Sunday, we desperately need youth volunteers. <laughs> well, the abusers just love that church, right? Because yeah, all yeah. he's got to do is raise his hand. Hey, I might be able to help. Yeah, yeah. And in our church, you have to wait to get a calling. Yeah. Maybe if you're an abuser sitting in our church, maybe you get a youth calling and maybe you get assistant finance clerk. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right. So let's go back to this this article. Is written like you said. We're not throwing this writer mm -hmm. in the bus. Very well respected yep. writer. Yep. Done some great stories and whatnot. Where would you say that uh, they get it wrong? So he suggests over and over in the article that the church was actively involved in cover up. Okay. There isn't any evidence in that of that. It it's not in the court documents. And maybe is he framing that call to the, the helpline as like, then they said no, and so then that's, they're actively... He does not present evidence for that claim in his article, yeah. right? Because like we he, don't know what was said in that phone call, right? Yeah. yeah. So I, that's one nuance of the article that I wish was different. Um, he does not seem to understand in the article that bishops are volunteers. They're probably marketing majors. Um, they're not trained in what to do. The helpline is actually necessary. A, a lot of that article is like, why in the world do you have this helpline? Clearly, it's just to enable abuse. No, it's not. He doesn't understand why it's there. And I, uh -huh. I wish there had been a better understanding. But this is what this is our job, yeah, right? We got to go back into film context. Mm -hmm. um, I did mention this before. The abuse went on for seven years. He was only a member for three of those. He gets excommunicated. Mm -hmm. um, the guy the guy actually only gets caught because one of the videos is found by someone. It's Australia or New Zealand. It's probably New Zealand. Somebody in, in another country finds one of the videos, and this guy's face is clear in the video. And so they send it. A government official there sends it to Washington, D.C., Center for Exploited and Missing Children, to say, we need to figure out who this man is and who, who are, who's this girl in this video being abused. They were able to match the guy's face to his passport photo hmm. in, like, four minutes. Yeah. So the article seems to imply that hiding abuse is the norm. Yeah, and that's the one thing that just... The, the social media response to it has grabbed onto that piece, 
My biggest concern for the average church member is that that's the message they take from this. Our church hides abuse yeah. on the regular. This is, in fact, written into how we're supposed to do things. I hope on Sunday when when people are asking their bishop, did you see this terrible article? Bishop is able to say, like, look right here in the handbook. It's mm-hmm. right here, and you can see exactly what the goals of that helpline are and why people call there, and, and it is not to hide abuse. Yeah. The, the last bit is, um, you know, they portrayed this guy as an active member yeah. in the article, and we already talked yeah, about that. Was he? I don't think so. Yeah. Does that even matter? I don't know. It bugs me that that's in the article, though. Yeah. I think it does create that perception that we we want to protect those that have a long history and are well respected in our community. Yep. But if for this case, that was not the case. So we did it. Yeah, that's it. It's horrific from top to bottom. Yeah. These girls deserve every single bit of support. And the article has a church attorney calling the girls money grubbers. Mm-hmm. That's heartbreaking. That should that's immoral. That should have never happened. That's a bad, 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 bad comment. Don't call real legitimate victims yeah. money grubbers um because no amount of money will ever repair yeah. the trauma these individuals that is correct and, and they deserve whatever settlement they yeah. get yep um amen yeah amen so uh let's uh, put the call out maybe uh, if people are listening to this and you still have questions or maybe i missed one i try to be as thorough mm-hmm. as possible and as well as you did um if there are any follow-up questions uh Put them in the comments, or you can go to leadingsaints.org slash contact, and there uh, maybe we can do a quick Facebook Live or something and do a follow-up and, yeah. and answer those. Because yeah, these yeah, are yeah. this these this topic, this, these awful situations are worth discussing and analyzing and, and finding a, a better path. And leaders need to understand how yeah. to make the average member contextualize this and feel better. Yeah. That concludes my interview with Jen Roach. Wow, we did it. I hope we, we covered everything. Seriously, I want to have the most honest, open discussions about uh, these these types of topics. So if there's a question that we maybe missed that you want to write in, Jen will make herself available if we need to jump on and do a follow-up interview on, the, um, on Facebook Live or whatever it be. I'd love to hear it because I think the more we understand these issues, the stronger a resource we can be. And I really believe that church leaders are such a key in saving victims or potential victims from abuse. So we got to learn about this and we got to know that we can act in, in confidence, knowing that we can talk to youth, talk to individuals and protect them from perpetrators. And remember to review the Mentally Healthy Saints library, click the link in the show notes or go to leadingsaints.org slash 14. It came as a result of the position of leadership which was imposed upon us by the God of heaven who brought forth a restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when the declaration was made concerning the own and only true and living church upon the face of the earth, we were immediately put in a position of loneliness. The loneliness of leadership from which we cannot shrink nor run away, and to which we must face up with boldness and courage and ability.